everyone, and welcome to today's update on COVID-19 in New Brunswick. Bon après-midi, tout le monde, et bienvenue à cette mise à jour sur le COVID-19 au Nouveau-Brunswick. Les porte-paroles aujourd'hui dans l'ordre suivant. Speaking at this afternoon's briefing will be the following. The province's chief medical officer of health, Dr. Jennifer Russell, and the premier. The Honorable Blaine Higgs, premier of New Brunswick, and Dr. Jennifer Russell, the province's chief medical officer of health. Premier Higgs. Good afternoon. Bonjour. Earlier this week, public health shared projections of what is expected if we continue along the path we are currently on with the Omicron variant. We currently have 105 cases in hospital and 386 medical staff isolating and have tested positive with COVID. And the forecast shows that by the beginning of February, we could have 220 active hospitalizations. Ceci a grand impact. So no this has a great impact on our healthcare system for the people with COVID and also for all New Brunswickers who need primary health care. To mitigate the risks to our health care system and to ensure we can continue to provide essential and critical services. We previously identified the conditions that would necessitate moving to level three and all of those conditions have now been met. On the advice of public health, Cabinet is moving New Brunswick to the level three phase of our winter plan to manage COVID-19, effective tomorrow night at 11.59 p.m. We will be at level three for just over two weeks or 16 days until Sunday, January 30th at 11.59 p.m. Think of it as short-term pain for long-term gain. Cela nous donnera le temps. This will give us the time we need to slow down the transmission of the virus. This is time for New Brunswickers to get their booster dose of uh, the vaccine and for children aged 5 to 11 to get vaccinated of what the move to level three will actually mean. Moving to level three was never something I wanted to do. And I really hate to take this next step. As a province, we need to get to the root of the problem so we don't have to repeatedly do this. And that is why we've been precise here on the two week break. This two week requirement is to ensure that our health authorities can manage our hospital system. One thing we must, we must understand and we must be committed to is that we are not going to go through 2022 with our province in lockdown. We want to be in a position to have our schools and our businesses open at the end of these 16 days. Today, 83.3% of New Brunswickers have two doses of COVID-19 vaccine. 91% have one dose and 28.7% have received their booster, their booster dose. We currently have nine people in intensive care of which 78% have not received their booster or are not fully vaccinated. In other words, 9% of the population accounts for 70% of the hospitalizations. I've been asked many times in media interviews this week about how far I'm prepared and willing to go with vaccine mandates. And while I'm not going to elaborate without the discussion and a full discussion with health and cabinet, I will say we're, doing, we're going to do what is necessary to protect all of New Brunswickers and to compel people to get vaccinated. Life will become increasingly uncomfortable and more difficult for those who are able to be vaccinated, but choose not to be. We must also protect those who cannot be vaccinated. As we have done throughout the pandemic, we are taking steps to find a balance that enables us to provide the services that the public expects, while keeping our healthcare system from hitting a point 
where hard choices get made of who gets life-saving intervention because there are not enough resources available to deliver that care. Right now, Horizon and Vitalité regional health authorities, along with Extramural, Amnesty New Brunswick, are working together to make sure that critical life-saving services are available for New Brunswickers when they need them. I want to thank everyone for your continued hard work and dedication to keeping the people in this province healthy and safe as possible. I want to thank I want to thank each of you for your continued hard work and dedication to keeping the people of this province healthy and safe. I know this is not easy, and it has not been easy. And no one is more tired of COVID than I am. I know it has not been easy. Care system. The Department of Social Development is working with long-term care operators to create new emergency long-term care beds throughout the province. These beds will provide alternate placements for patients that are waiting in hospital until a bed in the preferred long-term care location becomes available. C'est une mesure à court term. Elle vit à aider la This is a short-term measure. It will help hospitals manage the crisis. We are trying to find new measures to help the healthcare system face the challenges. Remember that every one of us has a role to play. I ask each and every New Brunswicker to do their part by reducing your contacts and by protecting yourselves in every way possible. Protecting yourself and others that you could be around, but maybe it's not necessary to do so. And we're asking for this all out effort over these coming 16 days. This includes wearing a mask, maintaining physical distancing, and getting fully vaccinated, including receiving a booster dose. As we know, that has had a positive impact on reducing the severity of Omicron. If you're over 50 years of age, you are at higher risk of not just catching COVID-19, but of having a more serious case and ending up in hospital. Go and get your booster as soon as possible. If you haven't done so already, contact an RNA, RHA clinic or a participating pharmacist and make your appointment now. We are also in need of help from anyone with nursing experience, who is not currently working in the healthcare system or is available to help. Our frontline healthcare professionals are struggling to provide care to patients amidst very challenging working conditions. This includes anyone that has experience in vaccinations who can offer assistance at this time when we're going to try to get as many people boosted as possible in as shortest time as possible. We want to hear from you. If you have these qualifications, if you're a retired critical care nurse, a nurse with experience, not working for regional health authorities or extramural, but have critical care experience in any case. A casual or part-time nurse working for regional health authorities or extramural hospital, ambulance, New Brunswick with critical care experience and have your manager's approval to participate. A full-time regional health authority nurse with critical care experience who is presently working on a hospital unit experiencing a reduction in service or closure. A medical professional from other countries living in New Brunswick or Canada that could qualify to assist at this time. I've been in recent communication with dentists who certainly are well familiar with vaccinations, who are offering and willing to be part of a vaccination program to help us meet our goals and keep people safe. If you fail in any of these categories, if you fall into any of these categories and are interested in helping out, visit gnb.ca slash COVID critical care or email rn2 at gnb.ca to learn more. You can visit our COVID uh, GNB website and also learn more on how to volunteer. I know it will be a rough two weeks for New Brunswickers. But the move to level three is necessary to slow the spread of COVID-19. We need our children back in school and sports 
We need our businesses open and for business owners, owners to be able to make a living. Nous avons besoin que nos enfants retournent à l'école et au sport. Que nous commencions. We need our children back in school and sports. We need our businesses open and for business owners to be able to make a living. We need to be able to see our family and friends. Nous devons être capables de voir notre famille et nos amis. This is a path we must take to get to that destination sooner. We have seen in other provinces how Omicron has peaked, and then it drops off quickly. Our health authorities are, are seeing that same and predicting that same situation for New Brunswick. And we're seeing that we should peak this month and peak by the end of this month. Our challenge is in the healthcare system. Our challenge is be able to maintain critical services to people who need it outside of, of the infection of COVID. Our challenge is to do what we can and to do our part over these coming two weeks so we then can slow the spread. You know, it's likely many people will get COVID. And if it's an experience like I had, it was an experience where I was fully vaccinated and it was like a head cold. Yes, it contacted others, others got sick, but all were vaccinated and didn't have more of an experience than a head cold. But those that are not protected are so much more likely to be impacted negatively and even death and be in hospital. While some businesses will be able to continue to operate, the increased restrictions will greatly impact others. That is why we're taking steps to ensure help is available to those who need it most. Cabinet has approved opportunities in New Brunswick to launch an enhanced phase three of the NB Small Business Recovery Grant Program. Under phase three, eligible businesses can apply for a non-repayable grant of up to $10,000, which is a double the previous program. Les entreprises qui ont eu du soutien dans le cadre des deux premières phases, le programme REST. Under phase three, eligible businesses can apply for a non repayable grant of up to $10,000, which is double the previous program. Well, in phase three, Businesses can also access a one-time subsidy of up to $300 to help cover accounting costs incurred throughout the application process. In addition, we will expedite the assessment process and target a three to four day turnaround so that businesses impacted will see immediate relief. Application for this phase covers impacts experienced from December 13, 2021 until March 31, 2022. For more information about the NB Small Business Recovery Grant Program, call 1-833-799-7966 or email nav at navnb.ca. We will continue to listen to and to work with the business community, consider best practices, and address the implementation of long-term sustainable solutions as we move forward. New continuerons de côté et de... We will continue to listen and to and to work with the business community to consider best practices and address the implementation of long-term sustainable solutions as we move forward. I encourage New Brunswickers to do what they can to support local businesses in the days ahead. Place curbside orders, order takeout from your favorite restaurants, and thank them for persevering during trying times. Also, the New Brunswick Travel Registration Program is ending. This means that anyone coming into the province will no longer need to register their travel. Nous avons constaté un nouveau élevé de vaccination parmi les voyageurs. Cela comprend aussi. This continuing the travel registration program will allow enforcement officers with the Department of Public Safety to focus on ensuring individuals and businesses are in compliance with level three measures. The travel registration program will allow enforcement officers with the Department of Public Safety to focus on ensuring individuals and businesses are in compliance with level three measures. 
La joie à venir ne sera pas facile pour tous les gens de New Brunswick. The days to come are not going to be easy for our New Brunswickers. New measures will lower contacts by 30% and the number of people hospitalized by 70. But we know our number of active cases will still be high, as will the strain on our human resources. Moving to level three is not a measure I wanted to take. As I know, it is not going to be easy to many, but without doing it, our province could be in a much worse position with a hospital system that not only is in a crisis, but failing to serve the most critical needs. Level three measures are a last resort and a step we must take to protect our essential services and our hospitals. Le major de la phase 3 sont un dernier. Level three measures are a last resort and a step we must take to protect our essential services and our hospitals. Through the extensive data public health presented, the statistics and information compiled, there was really no other choice. After going through the extensive data public health presented, the statistics and information compiled, there was really no other choice. Public health as a province. We have followed the rules and advice, and it has gotten this far and it will get us to the end of this pandemic. I want to take this opportunity to thank all of our frontline workers, our teachers, educational assistants, healthcare workers, managers, all of those that are every day facing life with COVID in the business that they would normally be so routinely involved. We have seen amazing examples of dedication going above and beyond to help protect others in our province. And I'm so appreciated of everything that is being done to continue to keep our province moving in these very difficult times. But as we have done over the last two years, and as we must do at this time, we must come together. We must come together to slow the spread and reduce the number of hospitalization. That is our critical issue. We need each of you to just think a little harder about the role that you play each and every day in what we can do differently. Think about your loved ones. Think about the visits that you don't need to do. Think about what level three actually means. But most importantly, think about two weeks from now when we actually turn the corner, that we actually start to move out of a lockdown and we actually see our kids back in school when we actually see our sports teams, when we actually actively participate in events like we have done so much in the past. To ignore what is happening right today in our province would, would not be responsible. So let's not focus any more on the two weeks than what's necessary to be done. Let's, let's be thankful that we can target beyond this and see a life returning where we can manage with COVID and we can manage beyond COVID. And that's why it's important right now to act. And if you have neighbors who are living alone, check and make sure they're okay and help them if you can, as I'm sure many, many have done throughout the pandemic. We will overcome this challenge as New Brunswickers just as we've overcome challenges in the past since we faced the pandemic. En tant que New Brunswick Quoi. As New Brunswickers, it is by working together that we will overcome this challenge. Just as we have overcome every challenge we have faced since the pandemic began. Thank you. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Good afternoon, everyone. The decision to move to level three of New Brunswick's COVID-19 winter plan was not an easy one. It was not made lightly. We are facing a critical situation and we need serious measures to address it. All of New Brunswickers need to take this seriously and be diligent about following these new restrictions. La décision de passer à la phase d'alerte 3. 
The decision to move to level three of New Brunswick's COVID-19 winter plan was not an easy one. It was not made lightly. We're facing a serious situation and we need serious measures to address it. And we need all of you to take this seriously and be diligent in following these new restrictions. Be higher. Our healthcare system, and to be clear, the staff that do the work in our healthcare system have been stressed after two years of dealing with this pandemic and is at a crisis stage. And when I say healthcare system, I don't just mean the hospital system, but also the long term care facilities. There's quite a relationship between these organizations, and they, uh, they depend on all of these staff to continue to deliver quality care. We may not be able to immediately make things better, but we must certainly do all we can to keep them from getting worse. À l'heure actuelle, 104 citoyens du Nouveau-Brunswick sont aussi. Today, there are 104 New Brunswickers in hospital due to COVID-19. Of those, nine are now in the ICU ward. If we did nothing, our projections show that by the end of this month, the number of hospitalized COVID-19 cases in our hospitals could pass 200. There are now 104 New Brunswickers in hospital due to COVID-19. Of those, nine are now in an ICU ward. This is the highest number of hospitalized patients since the pandemic began. Hospitalizations have increased steadily over the past two weeks and will, likely to continue, and will likely continue to rise in the days ahead. And at the same time that this is happening, we have record numbers of healthcare workers with COVID and isolating right now, which, can, which, which compounds this situation. If we did nothing, our projections show that by the end of this month, the number of hospitalized COVID-19 cases in our hospital will pass 200. And this is why we are acting today. If we can all reduce our contacts by 30% over the next two weeks, we can lower the projected peak of hospitalizations from 220 to around 150. This will still be challenging for our healthcare system and for our healthcare workers and those working tirelessly to manage this crisis, but it will be manageable. The aim of the measures which go into effect tomorrow night is to limit COVID-19's opportunity to spread by reducing contact between people. With approximately 1,000 new cases each day being detected through PCR and rapid tests, it is clear that the Omicron variant is far more transmissible and infects much more readily than earlier versions of the COVID-19 virus. It is vital that we reduce the contact that allows it to spread. And even with these measures, we expect to continue to see rising case numbers and hospitalizations for COVID-19 over the next several weeks. But how steep that rise will be will depend on everyone following public health measures. Dans le but de freiner les propagations, in order to slow the spread of this virus, all level three of our winter plan will prohibit all public gatherings, including closing theaters cinemas and other entertainment centers. Faith-based gatherings may only take place or outdoors or with the in-car services. Gyms, spas, and salons must close for the duration of the level three restrictions. Restaurants will be limited to takeout and delivery only. Retail businesses will remain open under the same conditions as at level two. Oh, the spread of this virus, level three of our winter plan will prohibit all public gatherings, including closing theaters, cinemas, and other entertainment centers. Faith-based gatherings may only take place or out, outdoors or with in-car services. Organized team sports are prohibited for gameplay, competition and practice with people outside of your household bubble. Individual sports that can be conducted outdoors, such as skiing, skating, and snowmobiling are permitted as long as distancing is maintained with those outside of your bubble. Buildings that support outdoor sports, such as ski lodges and warm-up shelters may only remain at 50%. Capacity and food and drink must not be served. Gyms, spas, and salons must close for the duration of the level three restrictions. 
Restaurants will be limited to drive through takeout, and delivery only. Retail businesses will remain open under the same conditions as Level 2. This is a change from the original winter plan. Contacts during shopping are generally short in duration and in small numbers for transactions, which reduces the risk of transmission. However, we do encourage curbside pickup or delivery services whenever possible and if you must go out. And if you are doing shopping, it would be wise to just have one person per household doing that. Cependant, nous encourageons les gens à avoir recours au service. However, we do encourage curbside pickup or delivery services whenever possible and if you must go out, please limit your contact with others when you are shopping. With others when you are shopping, only go out for necessities when feasible and assign one household member to do the shopping. But the most important action we can all take is to limit our personal contacts to a single household bubble. A single household bubble includes the people you live with. Where required, your bubble can be extended to include a caregiver to support the needs of someone in the household, one other person who needs support, such as another family member or a person who lives alone, children from another household for the purposes of informal daycare or online education support, and in cases of joint custody, children would be considered part of both single household bubbles. It is very important that you keep your bubble consistent. If you are extending your bubble, keep it to the same individuals for the duration of the level three restrictions. The Omicron variant can infect anyone, but those at the greatest risk are the unvaccinated and the undervaccinated, which includes those who have not received their second shot or not received their booster shot for which they are now eligible. Obviously, we know there are vulnerable populations as well who are, who are more vulnerable to symptoms of COVID and hospitalization and even death, and those people are also encouraged to get boosted as soon as possible. Together, these groups make up almost 75% of New Brunswickers now hospitalized for COVID-19. Children make up the largest segment of our unvaccinated or undervaccinated population. We must protect them from contracting COVID-19 and prevent them from spreading the virus to others, particularly those who are older and more vulnerable. And vulnerable can mean because of age, vulnerable can mean because of um, chronic medical conditions, immune compromised states, etc. New Brunswick Public Schools will extend the period of at-home learning by a further week to encompass the period of Level 3 restrictions, and that means students will not return to in-class learning until January 31st. A small number of students who have been identified by schools and districts as being vulnerable will be able to continue learning in person. I cannot stress enough the importance of following the measures being announced today. Please don't look for loopholes. You will just be bringing the virus along with you, and the consequences could be dire for yourself, your family, your friends, and others. It is vital that everyone do their part because the crisis will affect all of us. And by doing your part, that means following the public health measures and getting vaccinated or boosted because the cumulative benefit of both of these things are what's going to help us in this crisis. It will affect those who become infected, even if you are fortunate enough to experience only mild symptoms. It will definitely impact those who become more seriously ill and require hospital care. It will affect thousands of others who are unable to work due to illness or required isolation, as well as their co-workers and the general public who depend on their services. And I'm talking about critical infrastructure like fire, police, ambulance, snow plows, etc. But it will also have a serious impact on those who rely on the healthcare system to be there when they need it. And by that, it's healthcare workers, the staff that we need to care for people in hospital, in critical situations, in the emergency department, etc. For reasons that have nothing to do with, with COVID necessarily, car accidents and heart attacks aren't going to automatically stop just because the health system is overrun with COVID patients as at the exact same time that a large portion of healthcare workers are isolating or COVID positive. In ordinary times, these incidents are routinely addressed and are often survivable. And no one wants to see people die who have been saved, could have been saved if their hospital had beds and staff to treat them. We must all act together to limit the impact of this crisis. Au cours des deux prochaines For the next two weeks, stick to your one household bubble. Limit your contact with others as much as you can. Get vaccinated and get boosted. These two together will help us in this crisis. It is no exaggeration to say that this is a matter of life and death.
get boosted, it is no exaggeration to say that this is a matter of life and death. Things are going to get worse in the days ahead before they get better. How much worse will depend on all of you getting vaccinated or boosted and keeping to your one household bubble. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Thank you both. Thank you, Dr. Russell, Premier Higgs. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Premier Ministre, Dr. Russell. We'll now proceed with questions from members of the media. Each reporter will have one question. You have the right to pose your question in the official language of your choice. Nous allons maintenant procéder aux questions des journalistes. Vous avez le droit de poser votre question dans la langue officielle de votre choix. Chaque journaliste aura une question. Avant de commencer, j'aimerais informer tout le monde que la Dr. France Desrosiers, président directrice générale de réseau de santé de vitalité, et le Dr. John Dornan, président directeur par intérim de réseau de santé Horizon, sont présents dans la salle si vous avez des questions à leur poser. Before we proceed, I'd just like to notify everybody that both Dr. France Desrosiers, CEO of the Vitalité Health Network, and Dr. John Dornan, interim CEO of the Horizon Health Network, are present in the room should you have any questions for them. Laura Brown, CTV. Uh, hi there. I'm, I guess um, I'd like to know what happens on January 30th if we're still in the same situation or even worse. I mean, just two days ago, it's been predicted that 220 people will be in hospital at that time. So I'm wondering what if there's a further plan after this. projections are right now uh, and, and the projections based on how low everybody uh, is able to get their close contacts, that's really is, is what's going to um, show us whether we've been successful or not with these measures, again, along with getting people vaccinated and boosted. So again, at this time, based on the projections and based on everybody reducing their contacts by 30 percent, uh, we're, we're hopeful and uh, moving in the direction of, of uh, uh, the fact that we will be where we want to be at that time. Um, but obviously, this is a fluid situation, and uh, if everybody does their best, then, then we'll be where we need to be at that time. Premier? Yes, I think I, I would just to add to the, to the point that it was, it was a, uh, a difficult decision. You know, we, we spent a long time reviewing this, not only with the medical professionals, but also with my colleagues and, and others in relation to the options. And, you know, as I said during, the, during my, my talk, that we've, we've followed the recommendations of public health throughout, and, and it's got us this far, and we've worked with health professionals to, to keep, us, keep us moving through this pandemic. It's important that, you know, we could look back and say, because the last person that wanted to shut down, go to level three, was myself. Um, I, I know the impact it has on, on individuals. I know the impact it has on families and businesses. But I'm not unique to that. But looking at it from purely a, a, a lifestyle situation. But the risk was that it could be much prolonged and we move well beyond 16 weeks in a situation in our hospitals that took, took much, much longer to recover. And in, in the same time, having a very significant risk of impacting other uh, health issues or concerns outside of COVID, where doctors would be faced to make life-threatening or life choices on who lives and who dies. We could not, in all conscience, put our medical professionals in that position. We are optimistic that come in February, early after this 16 days, that we will be able to return and move upward and, and live with COVID in 2022 and get back to life as normal. We need the boosting program to be expedited. We need people to really roll up their sleeves and let's get to that, that uh, herd immunity. And we also need to deal with the unvaccinated who have chosen for whatever reason to put many people at risk. So we will be weighing all those issues over this coming two weeks with the whole plan of resuming activities on the 1st of February. Thank you both. Nathan DeLong with the Miramichi Leader. Good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you, Bruce. My question is for Premier Higgs. I'm wondering what the this development means for the Miramichi area by-elections. We continue to have two large 
writings side by side that have lacked representation in legislative assembly for several months now. Uh, what is your plan for setting a date for these by-elections? I plan to set a date um, within this time period, in the, within the next two weeks. And, um, and because I do agree with you, we have to find a, uh, a path forward here so that the, the, uh, there is representation in those regions. And, and, uh, but certainly, uh, we did not want to do that in the height of COVID. And we want to make sure that we've kind of managed our way through this. Uh, but, but over the next two weeks, we will identify a date. Thank you. Thank you. Vicki Hogarth, CHCO TV. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, my question is for Dr. Russell and maybe Dr. Dornan as well. Uh, hundreds of healthcare workers are off work and isolating with COVID-19, but are there also a significant number leaving their jobs temporarily or for good just due to burnout or stress of or fear of getting the virus and spreading it to their families? So by the time this, this fifth wave peaks and de-escalates, will the majority of healthcare workers likely have contracted the virus? Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. You know, I can't help but preface my remarks to say that we, we've been up here uh, twice, three times this week, and with, it's with an ask. And it's with an ask that we go to level three. Uh, we are suffering in our health care system, and we just simply cannot tolerate uh, 220 inpatients with, with COVID. And it's not just 220 inpatients with COVID. Our buffer is further uh, eroded because people are off. People are off for stressful reasons, and people are off because they have COVID, and people are off because they have contacts. And it's not a simple COVID uh, contact that puts you out for two weeks. We are asking our staff to come back in that have COVID infections to look after our patients. Now, they look after people that already have COVID infections, but we are adding to the stresses of our staff by asking them to step up. And we're here with our uh, glove in hand or cap in hand to ask the community to follow us and step up and reduce contacts. And I don't do that uh, shyly. You know, we are asking uh, New Brunswickers to reduce contacts significantly by 20-30% and that will take the significant bulk away of those 220 admissions. And so I really believe that um, our community will be behind us as health care givers so that we can look after New Brunswickers so that fewer people come into our hospitals and die. Four people died yesterday. That's not acceptable. And we don't want to see that grow in the succeeding weeks. And give us two weeks of your best effort at reducing contact. We can make a difference. And we uh, talked earlier about uh, you know, what happens at the end of two weeks and we're still at 220. Well, that was assuming no reduction in contacts. If we reduce contacts tomorrow by 20, 30 percent, then we will not be at that 220 mark. And I, I can't express my gratitude for the people that work in the healthcare system that come in day after day, burnt out, tired, double shifts. We have to ask people to stay overnight now and do 24 hour shifts. And, and they're doing it, they're stepping up. But when the community follows suit and reduces its contacts in the way that we are asking today, that will make a tremendous difference. You know, the term was used earlier, flattening the curve. We can flatten the curve of admissions so that we can tolerate this, get beyond two weeks. Uh, people that we look after will be immensely thankful for the New Brunswickers that have done that. You know, as, as the Premier says, uh, you know, restaurants take a hit here. We're thankful. And we're thankful that people will support industry business by ordering out and things like that. And uh, I can't express my gratitude for the reduced contacts that you will have. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Dornan. Thank you, Ms. Hogarth. Adam Harris with Brunswick News. Thanks, Bruce. Um, Premier Higgs, you said life will become increasingly more difficult for the unvaccinated. Um, could you weigh in on Quebec charging the unvaccinated a fee for health care and then elaborate on what's on the table for you and what is off the table for you in terms of the unvaccinated? I think that, you know, everything has to be on the table. And I think the difference and nuance here is that this is a situation that's now impacting the masses in our province. And when you start to impact hospitals negatively, like, like we're seeing, and when we, you know, in the, since December 1st, we've had 30 people die in New Brunswick. And, and in that case, 77% have been vaccination, unvaccinated, partially vaccinated, or behind in their booster shot. So almost 80% or 23 of the 30, and, and others had compromising factors. 
So, you know, there lies the issue. So we can't ignore it. Now, the situation that, that was uh, mentioned in Quebec about a health tax, we have to look at that in the context of our public health system. And, and where does that stop? And I, I believe, you know, you can say this is different because it's impacting many. But at the same token, you have to be careful that, you know, you're not in a position that, okay, does it, does it mean something if someone comes in that doesn't have the same health, healthy factors or looked after themselves the same as others? Uh, where does that all go? So it's not as simple, uh, simple as a health tax might seem. But I think other areas of inconvenience would be in relation to events, events of all kinds uh, that require mass gatherings, that require people to uh, you know, be with others and, and potentially be a, a factor in, in passing the virus. Uh, if you're vaccinated, fine. If you're not, then there will be an impact. We cannot continue to e revolve around an unvaccinated population that is having such a significant impact on the on 90 percent of the people in this province. So the point is, I've asked for all indications from different departments of where we can tighten tighten the restrictions on those that refuse to help protect the masses. Thank you, Andrew Waugh, Brunswick News. Hey, Premier. Um, Wanted to know why, like, you know, lead up to Christmas, you spent a lot of time saying, hey, you know, I don't know about going to level three because I don't think anyone's going to listen to me. So here we are going to level three. I would like to understand why you think people will listen to you now. And I'd also like you to expand on the decision to allow retail businesses to stay open, please. So I guess thinking about why we're here, and, and it's, it's absolutely correct. I, I didn't want to do this and very concerned about the, the, uh, the adherence. But I think what's different this time is in relation to the fact that we have put a two-week window on this because we know we cannot continue to expect, you know, the 90-plus the percent of our population that are vaccinated to say, well, look, I'm vaccinated. I've done everything you've asked me to do. And yet I'm still restricted with my family, with my, with my activities, our schools. We cannot continue to ask people to do that. That's why it's a two-week window. And it's, very, and it's a very precise reason. When we put out the level one, two, and three, it was clear the measures that would be required or the situations that would be required in order to implement level three. All of those conditions have been met and it caused a reassessment from public health. And when you see the CEOs of our health authorities here in person representing the concerns they have of the many people that they work with throughout the networks in our province, passionately asking for their, our support and the public support to help them manage their healthcare system and the many, many dedicated people that work within it. You can't say no. It would be totally irresponsible for me to say no and say, oh, well, I, I think we should stay open. Obviously, the facts outweigh any sort of other thoughts that I might have in relation to the impacts and inconvenience it creates. Yes, it's an inconvenience, but the cost can be so much higher. And we have a two-week window here where we have to slow this down in order to manage it. So it's pretty clear on why we must go the direction we're in. And, you know, I've said throughout all of the activities, there are many dedicated and professional people within our, our civil service. And every one of them wants to see a better New Brunswick. And in this case, it's about health. And we have to recognize their professions and their professionalism and their experience in, in recommending what's necessary for the best outcome. Thank you. Sorry, and businesses? Sorry, I did ask about Question businesses. About why? The, about why? Excuse me, Andrew. Dr. Russell is going to talk yeah. about it, yeah. and then we're going to move oh, to thanks. the next reporter. Thank you. Yeah. So, Andrew, basically, the, that, the contact that people have during shopping is generally very short in duration and very small numbers in terms of transactions, and that is why it's a lower risk of transmission, and so that's why we're allowing retail to stay open. And the whole issue around changing our um, travel registry and the enforcement around that is that we can then redeploy our public safety folks to, to keep a closer eye on all of the things that need to be happening within those retail spaces in terms of distancing, signage, et cetera. Thank you. Simon Delat, La Quête Nouvelle. Oui, une question pour le Premier ministre Blaine Higgs. The question is for the Premier about the possible measures for the unvaccinated. 
why, when will these decisions be made, and why not introduce these decisions today while the children cannot go to school and the people are being locked down? I think we've seen, certainly in the other provinces, we've seen the, the situation that they're in, um, you know, particularly uh, what Ontario is going through in Quebec. And, and it's, it's certainly, we're not to that level, however, what we're acting today is a general requirement that goes beyond just the unvaccinated in order to limit hospitalizations um, and do so in a, in a quick fashion to, to, to do this lockdown quickly and do so over the next two weeks. So over this next two weeks, we will very much be evaluating what other uh, factors can we consider in encouraging people to become vaccinated, in, in making it more difficult to be uh, outside of the norm here, because we need everyone to be part of this, and we need to get to a level that our healthcare system is not at risk. So this two weeks is required for everyone, but we're not going to go on and keep, keep our province uh, lock down or keep our lifestyles so disrupted because of a few. So over this next two weeks, we'll develop other measures as necessary based on what we see happening uh, immediately in this next, uh, in this next few, few weeks. Thank you both. Bobby Jean McKinnon, CBC. We'll now go to Eloise Rodriguez of Radio Canada. Yes, hi. My question is for Premier Higgs. I was talking to business owners and restaurant owners, and some people have fallen through the cracks because they opened businesses in 2020. So during the pandemic, they weren't able to get any help from the government. So are you going to amend your previous uh, financial help to make sure that everyone is included in the province, including those who opened businesses during the pandemic? Uh, yes, we are looking at, and this program that we put in place as part of this announcement, recognizing the impact it's had on businesses. So um, I, I don't know those specific situations. I can understand where ones that opened. It's hard to have a history there of what it looks like for revenue. But my intent here is that we will work with every company to understand how our measures are restricting their activity and what impact that's had and provide a, a you know, a, uh, an offset grant here to, to help in this matter. Thank you. Derek Haggett with Brunswick News. Hi there. My question is for either Premier Higgs or Dr. Russell. Uh, children under the age of 12 have not been in school since December 17th. It'll be a total of seven weeks until they return, perhaps longer. What message do you have for flustered working parents in the province right now who are struggling with learning from home? Mr. Haggett, can you... Uh Approach your microphone a little louder, please, and repeat it quickly. Thank you. Sure. I was just asking that. I was saying the children in the 12 have not been in school since December 17th. It'll be a total of seven weeks, perhaps longer, until they return. Any message for flustered working parents in the province right now that are having a, a hard time with online learning? There is no question that children who are at home right now, um, this is less than ideal situation. Uh, and we know that the negative impacts of kids being at home right now is are they're huge. There's been studies done on this. There's there's absolutely no question about that. So the level of frustration and difficulty right now is completely understandable. Uh, we know it takes a toll on mental health and, and development and so many other things, not just with the children, but the families that are struggling to support the kids who are trying to learn at home. So. Um, Again, these, these are not decisions that we take lightly. There are lots of discussion uh, weighing the risks and benefits. And, and you'll see across this country that, you know, there are different approaches and, and some jurisdictions have opted to try to keep schools open uh, with the caveat that if they reach a 30% um, absenteeism rate, then they will close. Um, you know, it, we're, we're watching this play out in real time across the country. We're doing what we need to do here in New Brunswick to protect our healthcare system and our healthcare workers at this time and critical infrastructure. Um, and, uh, you know, as much as we can, we need to support each other as much as we can. Um, we need to check on our friends and our neighbors and, and uh, we need to try to weather this storm. It's, it's unfortunate, uh, but it's necessary. Thank you. Premier? 
The only thing I, I guess I just want to add to that, because it's absolutely correct what Dr. Russell is saying, obviously, it's we need two weeks more. And that's what this is all about. We need two weeks more. And I know what it's causing parents with young kids at home. I had my family home over Christmas. And, um, you know, we stayed within our limits, but there were five young kids. And I can only imagine what that's like on a daily basis. So it's, uh, it's real. So two weeks more. And, and let's, let's get through this. And I'm optimistic that we'll see a difference in the next month. Thank you both. On va passer avec M. Nicolas. Thank you. We will now move on to Nicolas Steinbach from Radio Canada. Thank you, Bruce. Should we understand in your logic that if everything goes as planned in the next two weeks and that we manage to make the number of cases go down, we could imagine a more optimistic scenario that on the 31st, the children go back to school and we move on to uh, level one in an optimistic scenario on uh, January 31st? Because, yes, that is our target, is that we would be able to return to school um, on January 31st. And, you know, I've spoken to the minister, and we, we've talked here about what, what opportunity, what, what potential exists, but it does depend clearly on, on what we're trying to manage right here, right now. And, and so it'll still be a factor based on our hospitals and, and the level of capability we have within. And, and we see, obviously, the projections show a decline in, ca in, uh, in cases, which would mean a decline in hospitalizations. And with, with these measures in place, we hope that to be, obviously, a much steeper decline and uh, then, then, the, then certainly the worst case, but much, much better. And that would mean um, an opportunity to put our schools back. That's last comment about the schools, um, because one of the things that this two weeks is going to give us the opportunity to do is get making sure that the teachers have their boosters and making sure that the eligible students that can be vaccinated with their first or second dose, uh, that that happens in this time frame. Merci beaucoup. Est-ce que le docteur, est que le docteur Russell peut le répéter en français seulement, si possible? Oui, l'avantage de les deux. Yes, the benefit with the, the extra two weeks is that we can give the booster shot to the eligible teachers and that we can give uh, first and second doses to students who are also eligible. MA. Uh, hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay, um, following up on Derek's question, uh, in recent days, I, I spoke to an early childhood educator. She said because schools are closed, but parents are still going to work, parents are leaving their kids at uh, the daycare, leaving early childhood educators responsible for helping these kids with their online courses. What's being done to take pressure off of early childhood educator, educators right now and, and, and parents who are struggling for that matter? I don't know that I can add much to the what's being actually done. I know there's a strain on the on the um, early childhood educators and within our daycare system, and and I know it's a strain on parents. and And so I I can't speak specifically into what's being done. I know we've looked at uh, increases there. We've looked at uh, benefits that we can provide to daycare operators to, in order to have a um, safe and a healthy environment. Uh, as far as the online learning piece that you reference and, and their responsibilities in that regard, I think the most I, I, I can say about that, and we could maybe get more information if there is available, uh, we're not happy with, with online being a solution of, of, uh, of, of, of long term of, of any kind or being a solution that, that works for parents or kids. But it's the best we have in these trying times. And that's why the focus is so much on let's, uh, let's get back and get open. And, and let's just deal with these two weeks to, to allow us to get there. And to Dr. Russell's point, it is, is extremely important that we have the ramp up in vaccinations uh, to get people, the, the teachers and students vaccinated that allow us to get the schools open. So um, I, I think we're not pretending that online learning is the answer. Uh, we know it's a struggle no matter whether parents are home or whether it's in the daycares. Uh, but we need to focus on just getting back into classrooms. Thank you. Sean Hatcher, Brunswick News. Thank you. My question is for Dr. Russell on the impact of uh, sports and recreation activities. It looks like uh, that section in level three has been modified from no activities permitted to allowing 
some activities within a single household bubble. So why was that change made? And can you kind of clarify like, what activities people can do over the next 16, 16 days and who they can do them with? Well, we're trying to be uh, surgical, excuse the pun, around risks uh, and offsetting uh, the, the, the negative impacts and, and unintended consequences. So the fact that we're allowing these outdoor activities to happen, uh, you know, these are, these are singular activities that you can do by yourself outdoors, or if you are doing it uh, with people in your bubble, great. Um, and if you can safely distance from others who are outside your bubble, great. And we know that this goes a very long way in terms of helping with people's physical activity and their mental health. Thank you. Mia Urquhart with CBC. Thanks, Bruce. Can somebody tell me how many hospital beds and ICU beds Horizon and Vitalite each have and how many ventilators the province has? <laughs> Ladies first. I can uh, speak for Vitalité. So at Vitalité, we have 960 beds. For now, we have the capacity to offer services for 824 beds, and we have 43 ICU beds and 82 respirators. Thank, thank you for the question. We have uh, approximately 100 ICU beds in uh, Horizon. Uh, we have more ventilators than that. That will not be our uh, bottleneck. Our bottleneck will be staff. And uh, we will fill those beds, not with COVID people, but with COVID people plus all the other reasons that you need ICU care. That doesn't go away. Matthew Papillon with Radio Canada. Uh, oui, bonjour. Dr. Russell, question for you. Dr. Russell, this is a question for you. What is the ultimate goal of uh, the level three measures and uh, with which criteria will you be able to say that the, the goal has been met in two weeks? So the goal is to protect the healthcare system, which means that the people who need healthcare service admissions at the ICU or uh, emergency services, we must be able to protect the capacity and offer those services and protect the people who haven't gotten their booster or uh, their first and second dose of their vaccine. And I will now let the Dr. De Rosier uh, add a word. I have a message. I have a few very important messages I would like to share with you today. I would like to thank in advance New Brunswickers for their collaboration during this crisis. And I would like to underline the great work of uh, healthcare workers. I would like to thank the clinical teams on the ground, in the community, the lab teams, the healthcare teams, my communication team, and human resources. I'm almost scared to forget some of them. These people have uh, gone through all four phases of the pandemic. And what we are trying to do today is to lower the fifth wave. It's been very hard. And I told you earlier that the Vitality Health Network was ready. There are contingency plans are ready. We have three different intervention levels because of an unprecedented crisis in the human resources in healthcare. So we have the emergency and the critical phases. I believe that New Brunswickers deserve to understand that we are going from the contingency phase to the emergency phase. What does it mean on the ground? It means that we have already started to redeploy employees from one sector to another. 
from one hospital to another. We've already started to have people come back to work early, five days after being uh, diagnosed with COVID. The goal of uh, flattening the curb was to not go into critical phase. Going into critical phase means having to make difficult ethical choices, which means having to choose who will be allowed to get a respirator. It will put some patients at risk because they will have to stay home for semi-urgent care with the risk that those become emergency care at home. This is a disastrous situation that we do not want to get to. We do not want to get to the critical phase. We had a window of opportunity to act, and we needed to put this in place for two weeks. And after that, we know that the curb will be flattened if everybody plays, does their part, which which is limit your contacts and get vaccinated. This is the only way we can get to it. And I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Yes, uh, my, my, my question's for the, uh, the Premier. And uh, given the low number of uh, active cases in Zone 5, it was 159 PCR confirmed cases uh, yesterday. Uh, the lowest by far of the seven zones. The lowest was, uh, the next lowest was 423, I think it was, in Zone 7. Uh, why was it put in this phase with the rest of the province? Uh, the, the chair of the Restigus Regional Service Commission said today the people of the zone did what they're expected to do, and uh, active case counts were kept low, but now they face the same restrictions as everyone else in the province. Uh, what do you say to that, to those comments? Well, I think that um, what we've realized is uh, with Omicron is it, it transmits easily and, and everywhere. We also, um, we've also realized that in, in being able to keep up with the level of testing, that PCR testing only reflects a, a portion of the active case counts that could actually be in the field, because we are relying on, on rapid testing and we are relying on people to report the outcome. So I, I think given where we are with the two-week period here that we're focused on, that it's, uh, it would be unreasonable to try to single out a zone as we have in the past. Um, we know that it, uh, because it can become confusing and we can, you know, see people move from one zone to another to have a different level of restriction and we saw that before. You know, you could manage that in some ways with previous uh, variants, but this one is, is different. So I, I guess I just go back to the point that it, it's about us working together as a province and it's about us managing this in, in the next two weeks in a way like we've, we've maybe never done before to, to really pay attention to the rules. We won't be able to enforce the rules in a way that will catch everyone. And if people feel that uh, feel good about violating the rules or causing an outbreak and, and maybe someone else in hospital that, that dies, that's a sad state, on a commentary on society. So we've got a window. That's why the professionals that you know have recommended this two weeks because it's a very critical time for all of us in our province. Thank you. Pascal Rochnag with Radio Canada. Bonjour, ma question. Hello. Uh, my question is for Dr. Russell. You answered it in English a few times. I would like to get the explanation in French. Why did you change phase three? What is the rationale for this choice uh, of uh, letting uh, retail businesses uh, um, remain open? Yes, I can answer. It's because of uh, the risks of, a sub of a different activities. With retail, usually we are not in the business for a long time and distancing is guaranteed. So there is a very limited uh, risk. Hi there. My question is for the Premier. Uh, Premier Higgs, you touched on your personal experience with COVID-19. I'm curious if having the virus changed your mind at, about it at all, if, if steps towards living with COVID are still worth the risk of catching it, in your opinion, particularly for more vulnerable New Brunswickers. Well, I think that, you know, the vulnerability is, is, is a personal term in many ways, but it has to be one that, that people take seriously. 
And if you have other mitigating factors, you know, uh, vaccinations uh, in addition to public safety rules will indeed be required. But for our personal situation, my personal situation, I, I was fully vaccinated. I received a booster. And, and I would think, you know, I'd like to think it would be an encouragement for many that, that it, was a, it was a head cold for me. And it was a head cold for my, my family uh, because we were all vaccinated. So there's a reason why we're pushing vaccinations so hard. This can be a situation where it becomes livable. It, we can keep moving on and, and have COVID uh, if we're fully vaccinated because it has said this vi uh, variant in my terms had very little health impact. Now that isn't for everybody, but it is for the masses if they're vaccinated fully. It's been proven. So, so I think optimistically, I'm saying we can return. We can have life as normal. We just have to get vaccinated. There are many vaccines that, that we take and kids take when they go to school, uh, when babies are born, that have become routine for a reason, because if they have been, been wiped out, illnesses that would, protect, would have in the past been fatal. So I, I, I'm a believer in the vaccinations, and I'm living proof that they work. Thank you. Isabel Legere with CBC. Can you hear me okay? A little louder, please, Ms. Legere. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Um, my question is for Dr. Dornan. Were you saying earlier that you've been asking all week for a move to level three? And how do you feel about waiting until Friday at midnight? Thank you very much. We were monitoring uh, triggers to move to level three, uh, including uh, hospital admission rates. We, were, we suspected that we would need to be in level three and forewarn government, uh, Department of Health people and others. And so now we've uh, reached those triggers. We, we didn't come to government today and say we need to move today. They had to consider other factors such as community, uh, mental health, uh, the economy. And so we served notice earlier in the week that we were looking that way. And so I'm quite pleased, frankly, that we've, uh, the government has pulled the pin for this Friday. Pulling the pin in two weeks from now would not have had an impact. So I'm, I'm quite pleased with the timeline that we've seen here. Thank you. Great. Harry Forrestal with CBC. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, this is a question for Dr. Dornan. Uh, Dr. Dornan, you mentioned earlier today four deaths yesterday. Were they all COVID-related deaths? And um, what relationship do they have to the sudden drop we saw in uh, ventilator-dependent uh, patients over the past two days, a uh, drop of 11 people using ventilators to just four using ventilators as of yesterday's numbers? Well, Mr. Forstel, I won't, can't get into the specifics, but yes, they are all COVID-related deaths. Um, there's not many days where we don't see uh, some impact on fatalities. And uh, yes, uh, ventilator use has gone down, ICU use has gone up. And it's not just because of Omicron, it's because of some persistent Delta. We've canceled 500 surgeries. We've canceled 14,000 tests to try to make space in our system. And so all that has a very negative impact on what we do today. And um, yeah, we're hopeful ventilator usage will go down, but COVID in and of itself uh, increases the, uh, the stressors in our hospital. Thank you, Dr. Dornan. Thank you, Premier. Thank you, Dr. Russell. Merci beaucoup, Dr. Derosier. Voilà la fin de notre mise à jour. Merci beaucoup. That concludes today's update.